Hey, what's up guys? I'm Shantae and you're watching Anything Goes. On the series finale, I sit down with author, podcaster and journalist Elizabeth Day. Follow along as we discuss Elizabeth's experience with divorce, how friendship groups are overrated and what sort of men to go for on dating apps. Hello and welcome back to Anything Goes with me, Shantae Joseph, your host. The person that we have on the show today is somebody that I truly, truly, truly admire. I'm here with award winning, you can't forget that bit, award winning podcaster, author and journalist, Elizabeth Day. Oh, thank it's you. It's so, so nice to have you on here. It, it really is. I cannot is. tell you how lovely it is to be on here and to meet you because the admiration goes both ways. For it real. really does. For I think real, you're amazing <laughs> and I love what you do. But you have a new book coming out, Philosophy. What got you interested in this idea of failure? I just felt we were living in a culture of curated perfection. Oh, 100%. Where it feels like sometimes you're only ever as good as your last Instagram post. Yeah. And you're constantly trying to show all of the kind of perfect outsides of your life, which other people can compare to their insides. So Mm. I come to Instagram knowing what a neurotic mess I am. (laughs) And I then am confronted with a Kardashian looking absolutely amazing off the coast of Costa Rica. Mm. And I'm in danger of thinking I'm less than, I'm not worth that. And, but I, I don't feel I could admit it. So yeah. it came from a space in my own life of realising that I had failed. And actually, more specifically, it came from a place of being dumped. Mm. So three weeks before my 39th birthday, a long-term relationship ended, for me, totally out of the blue. And I felt really at my lowest point because my 30s had been an incredibly intense decade mm. where... I got married and then divorced. I had tried and failed to have children. And then this new relationship had ended. Mm. And I was just left assessing those 10 years and thinking, wow, that has not gone according to plan. (laughs) And I just realised that every single time something hadn't gone according to plan, yes, it had been heartbreaking. Yes, it had been difficult. But I had survived it. And that made me feel really strong. So I started listening to a lot of podcasts and those two things came together. And as a journalist, I'd been interviewing a lot of people for publications Mm. and I'd always have to write something up to the behest of an editor who would generally always say, ask that person about the thing that you know they don't want to talk about. (laughs) And if it's a woman of a certain age, ask if she wants to settle down and have children. And I just got sick of it. And I just wanted like a more liberating format. So I was like, where, how can we talk more openly about vulnerability and failure? How can other people feel less alone? And what format could I do it in? And that's how I launched the podcast, How to Fail. Amazing. What were the biggest lessons from both your 20s and your 30s about failure? And in different ages, did you reckon with failure differently? Definitely. So, I mean, when I was growing up, I became like an inveterate people pleaser. And I think Mm. that's the case for a lot of women who were raised when I was raised, which was like the 80s. And I think it's changing now and we live in a more fluid world and I'm really grateful for that. Mm. But I still think there's a there's a sense that you're taught to be like nice and pleasant and think of other people first. Right. And for me at school, that became like doing well at exams. Like that was how I got approval and that was how I felt love. Yeah, oh which my is... days, hard relate. Do you? Yeah. When that happens, it leads you into a very fucked up mindset for your 20s because you don't take school exams anymore in your 20s, hopefully. (laughs) Um, And and there's no exam you can sit to show that you're a a good adult and that you're acing adulthood. So you outsource your sense of achievement to other things like personal relationships. And I just realised that I was spending a lot of time in my 20s trying to be successful and perfect and people please in all areas of my life yeah and I really lost my way and I didn't know who I was anymore by the end of that decade it's when I first went into therapy because I felt stuck a lot of my listeners are in their 20s and it breaks my heart that they feel unable to take risks because they're hamstrung by a fear of failure because so much of our lives is lived in public now yeah it's almost like for me I find it quite like haunting and I think a lot of what I have and who I am is based off what people how people feel about me do you know what I mean like I always get so insecure that I'm not living my 20s to the to the best of my ability do you know what I mean because I'm just all those opportunities which is definitely a class thing as well like are robbed from me well that's a really interesting point 
because privilege enables you to fail in so many ways. And mm. I'm aware that I speak from a position of extreme privilege, being white and middle class. Like I'm given more chances to fail at stuff. Yeah. And other people aren't. But I think what you've identified there is so interesting for two reasons. One is that idea of um, responding to people's responses to you. Mm. And that can be really difficult because essentially what you're doing is like you're outsourcing your life to other people's opinions of you, yeah. which is no way to live your own life. But if you're presenting an authentic version of yourself, which I think you are, I think it's fine because generally the response that you'll get, if it's positive, can feed into you feeling empowered by being yourself. Yeah. Because I think social media comes in for a lot of stick, but that's one way in which it can be used for the good. Yeah. It can be used as an accepting medium when you're putting forward your authentic self. Yeah. More people need to be like you and be honest about their experiences. So we stop being so hard on ourselves. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And totally. one thing as well, like I guess going into the topics of like relationships and stuff, like when I think of like my mum, my grandmother, all of my aunties, my godmother, they're all single women. Oh, they're all single love women. That raise their kids like independently like do you know what i mean and, and that is that is all i've seen yeah mm. i still feel this really paralyzing fear that i need to be partnered yeah and if i'm not partnered i'm not interesting enough or i'm not funny or there's something wrong with me despite my reality yeah being incredibly different to that you know i just i carry that weight and i just i don't know what it is about my material reality being so different to what i'm fed but i still can't make that connection, do you know what I mean? So many times in the past, particularly in my 20s, I had a five-year plan. And often it would be like elaborate and detailed yeah. and I'd have vast ambitions, but I would get to that five-year point and stuff would have happened. Like life would have happened in a different way. You yeah. can't control what happens a lot of the time. And I'd get to that five-year point and I hadn't managed to like run the London Marathon <laughs> and I wasn't like chief political correspondent on a daily newspaper. <laughs> But that was fine. Like yeah. I, I had other things going on, but because I'd had that five-year plan in the back of my mind, mm. I thought I was the failure. But I was only failing according to my own metrics. Yeah. And if failure is what happens when something doesn't go according to plan, you have to start questioning the plan and where it comes from. Yeah. So for you, this idea that you need to be partnered, where does that come from? Because as you say, you've got all these strong female role models in your life. Yeah. Does it potentially come from having watched too many romantic comedies? Yeah. Because that's where it came from for me. Yeah. And then you're like, well, that's a ridiculous way to live my life. Yeah. Like, that is honestly part of the reason I got married when I did. And I made the wrong decision. And and I had to like fess up to that and own up to it. And and a whole massive part of it was just because I loved Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> so question the plan is what yeah. I would say. But like, I think you're right, I do. And even it's really weird because when I watch TV and I see... Um, um, like love stories, and particularly ones where I've noticed where the characters are black, it's always, it's always a, a struggle love. It's yeah. always like, you know, the woman is this high flying um, lawyer or whatever, and then there's the male man and, you know, she falls yeah. in love. And I feel like so much of movies, like, I sound really bad, but so much of movies condition women to not lower their standards, but to be accepting of something that is maybe not equal to them. But how do you, so I'm very interested in the notion of black representation on screen and in books. Yeah. But a very good friend of mine works in publishing and she made the point that it's like, we need to read stories and see stories about black people being happy. Yeah. And like having like fully functional, wonderful lives as they do in all multifaceted glory because yeah. we are all human. And actually we need to get away from like very good novels, but about slavery. Yeah, like, there for needs real. to be more more space. It's like slavery, struggle, misery. Like now as well, one thing you kind of get taught is that you know you need to work like twice as hard as your mm. white counterparts. You need to work twice as hard as your peers in order to get you know to the same place they are, or to get even half as far as they are. And so you just become accustomed to this life of like constantly struggling and yeah. constantly overworking yourself. And I think that is something that has definitely like plagued me and now I'm like I'm just quitting I'm quitting I don't want to do it anymore I've, I don't want to be in that system and, yes you know it's, it's because hard. it is a system yeah you're right and you need to attack it obviously everyone is scared of failing 
But it's so weird because even when I think about failure, like it is, it is a construct. Failure totally. isn't real. Like there's failure yes. is not a material thing. So it's like how it's it's the same way online. Like the internet isn't a real thing. Like we all participate in this weird social space, but it's not actually real. But it yeah. has so much of a, an effect on us. And in the same that we can kind of unsubscribe from people we don't like unfollow people we don't like how do you unsubscribe from the idea of failure oh my god what a great question <laughs> <laughs> like the way it was put the way the bills are up, amazing <laughs> so you're totally right yeah. it's a, it's a it's a construct every failure can be treated as data acquisition it can be treated as a learning experience if you let it yeah so that breakup that caused me heartbreak so grateful for it now yeah because that was totally the wrong relationship and i learned so much about myself and what i did want because i had compared it to what i didn't want yeah so every failure can actually be data acquisition that will bring you closer to the thing that you are worthy of and that you deserve and that you want one thing i i feel like I don't know if it's if it's a my generation thing. Like divorce doesn't scare me. After I got divorced, when that happens, and I was thirty six, I was suddenly like, oh, I'm on my own now. So yeah. I need to forge my own path and create, recreate my own voice, which I felt had been really suppressed mm. in that relationship, and it was unbelievably empowering. Yeah. And all of my real success has come post divorce. Like my first best selling book the podcast, everything. It's its all happened in that time. Yeah. And that, I don't think is a coincidence. A blank canvas can be terrifying, but it can also be such an amazing opportunity. Yeah. We talk about like relationships and failure and like kind of like romantic relationships a lot, but what about friendships? Because one mm. thing I think I've really struggled with, I think in school, I moved school quite a few times. And so that made it really difficult for me to make friends. And then also just like in general, life like when you spoke about the beginning like having so much of your self-worth tied to accolades and achievements yeah. stuff like that that was very much me my whole life as well and it meant that i spent less time investing in friendships and more time investing in like roles and opportunities and yeah. committee positions and all this kind of stuff how do you navigate friendship as you get older we don't talk about it it doesn't feel it's not as sexy as relationships but it's such an important part yeah. of your, your growing and your being so glad you asked me about this because you're right it doesn't get the attention that it deserves yeah. and um first of all a group of friends is overrated <laughs> is what i want to say generally when i meet someone who's got like an established group of friends that they've had for 20 plus years i do always ask myself how much growing have you done yeah and i only made my best friends at university. So I'm actually a big advocate of making friends slightly later in life. Yeah. I think what you're saying is actually that you're selective about friends. Mm. What you're putting out there is, you need to be worthy of my time. Yeah. And I think, looking back on the choices I made, that is the far better way to be. I came from a position of extreme neediness. I was like, be my friend, be my friend. Yeah. I wasn't popular at school, please be my friend. Please love me, please tell me I'm worthwhile. Mm. And I ended up with loads and loads and loads of friends, but only a core group of people who really knew me. Yeah. And friendships, like, we're not taught that friendships can break up. Yeah, and they're hard as well, friendship so breakups. So hard. And I think it's because we don't have the language around yeah. it. Whereas socially and culturally, we, we're informed of a language around relationship breakups. Like yeah. We sort of know what to say and how <laughs> to do it. Whereas with a friendship, when I've had friendship breakups, and I've had a couple of like really brutal ones, someone can just disappear yeah. like that. And you will never know why. And quite often it's because it's their stuff. And where you're at in your life is bringing up their stuff and they yeah. can't deal with it. But it's very, very difficult to, out, to, to know how to break up a friendship. But we must all be allowed to outgrow certain friendships. Yeah. That's okay. It doesn't mean that you feel negatively about the person. It doesn't mean that you don't love them for that period of time in your life when you needed them. But we can learn from each other and move on. Yeah. And I think we all need to get much more comfortable with that. But mm. I feel like now, because I'm being fully myself in every area of my life, which is an immense gift, yeah. the, um, the friends I'm making are, are really good good ones because they know me for me rather than a version of me that I'm pretending to be yeah, or exactly. I feel slightly stressed about. On the subject of, of love and dating, yeah. um, I have my five most recent uh, hinge matches um, <laughs> and I want you to let me know like who is really catching your eye and who okay. I should, should match with. You know, I'm, I met my fiance on hinge. You, okay. So I'm, so I'm very well 
versed in this. Okay. This is, oh this my is God. them. <laughs> Going through this lot, so my top hinge tip is to go for the person that you wouldn't normally go for. Yeah. Maybe I should go for West Streeting. Well, West Streeting might have hidden qualities. Sometimes the most decent men are yeah. not the most vain men. So they will put up photos that are a bit shit. Yeah. And you've got to take that into account because actually you don't want someone who's constantly yeah. staring at himself in the mirror. Exactly. You don't want someone who's a raging narcissist. Yeah. Um, like, we've had enough narcissists in our lives now. Yeah. The fact that he's a politician might imply he's a narcissist, so that, that's, that's a bit dodgy. He's but basically I'm... a no. You know, I think we should just go on my actual Hinge profile. This is going to be so funny because my Hinge profile is a hot mess. Here's my account. Okay. Let me know your hot okay. takes. My most controversial opinion is sourdough tastes like rubbery ass. I hate that shit. Sorry, not sorry. Perfect hinge answer. Thank you. Oh, totally agree with you on sourdough. Thank the you. The only thing that makes it taste is salted butter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's make sure we're on the same page about oat milk being the most supreme milk alternative. <laughs> also very good because it gives an insight into who you are. A social cause I care about, police and prison abolition hun. Perfect. Because it's serious, but then you add the hun. Exactly. I think I put so an X there as well. You put an X there. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So what do you think? I do you think, think that gives a good impression of me? Yes, I absolutely do. Okay, so I don't have <clears> any <throat> recommendation. I think you've done a perfect job. I love that. Job. Thank you so much. Hopefully the next time we meet up, I'm but going I'm... on a date maybe. But yeah, it's actually been amazing talking to you. Like, I am obsessed. Oh, thank you, you so, so much. much. I love you so much. It's been <laughs> such a highlight meeting you in real life as well. And you're an amazing interviewer and I've loved it. I need to get on the podcast, that's what I need to do. Oh, I, need to that's, just... I meant to ask you, I meant to ask you so it was recorded and I had evidence. Please yeah, come yes. on the podcast. Of course, I'm there.